So um, what is money? Um, I like to think uh, of money fundamentally as purchasing power. It's the purchasing power over the goods and services that are produced in the economy. And it's purchasing power that importantly can be transferred through time. Uh, so that's sort of fundamentally how I think about money. Economists have different ways of defining it and measuring it. Um, everyone probably picks up a textbook, you'll see unit of account. That basically means a sort of standard by which we measure things, dollars and cents, for example. A medium of exchange, that's very important. Uh, we don't you know, barter. In fact, it's questionable whether we really ever did barter that much. Uh, but money is kind of like a, a medium of exchange, but also a way of keeping tally. And then it's a store of value. Again, transferring money or purchasing power through time. You mentioned that the yap and the stone. I think we read the same book, which is Milton Friedman's fantastic book. I think it was early 1990s called Money Mischief. Um, and if you read my book and you want a little bit more, I, I definitely recommend that book. But he has a wonderful tale of this uh, tribe, which he gets from an anthropologist who studied this, where the money uh, that was used were these, these giant stones. Um, and they, that represented the kind of the, the, the embodiment of the purchasing power. So if you kind of had a claim on the stone, that basically may, meant you had a claim on the goods and services that were produced by the people on the island. But the, the, the really funny sting in the tail of the story is that uh, many years ago, maybe centuries by now, when they were transporting one of these stones, it sunk to the bottom of the, of the ocean. But that didn't matter. They still used it as a kind of, uh, you know, a, 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 an embodiment of money. And Milton Friedman makes the very interesting point that it's not that much different from having all this gold at the bottom of the basement uh, of the New York Fed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's great. Now. This book was uh, is written, and I want to ask you. Let's just start off. Mm. Who's it written for? Who's the audience, and why did you choose this book for this audience? Right. Well, the audience, um, you know, and I kind of pushed a little bit back against book agents and and publishers to get there. Was well, is really for you know ordinary ordinary people, the general person who's not a specialist economist. Um, but who is interested in these topics, wants to understand more about how does how does money work, what's monetary policy, what's fiscal policy. Um, and the motivation was, you know, I spent a little bit more than two decades uh, in the financial markets, very nice six years with S&P Global, uh, was part of that, obviously. And, uh, you know, my job as an economist was to try to understand what was going on in the world of money and monetary policy and fiscal policy, how that influenced the economy, uh, and you know, write about that and talk about that. Uh, but you sort of do it in these little snippets, you know, weekly reports, you know, every now and again, maybe write a 15 page article. But I wanted to sort of bring that couple of decades of experience together uh, you know, into a book that would be accessible to people who were kind of interested in seeing, you know, the whole waterfront. And it's partly motivated by the fact that um, I think some of these topics are not that well understood necessarily. Um, and so I wanted to sort of shine some light on perhaps some of the myths or some of the misunderstandings uh, that surround the topic. I'm going to go into some deeper questions, but before I do, is there a is there a single headline that you bump into somebody in the elevator or somebody on the street and ask you, what's your book about? How do you answer that? The elevator pitch, right. Um, <laughs> it, it, I mean, in, it, the, the biggest sort of headline, I guess, is that I try to give, you know, a positive spin on money. Um, and, you know, money does get a bit of a bad name. I mean, we both walk, worked on Wall Street. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of criticism of, uh, you know, the way that the monetary system works. And it, there are a lot of people out there, gold bugs and others, are always trying to sort of change it. And we've got to go to a different system. Uh, a lot of discussion about inequality, for example. So I wanted to sort of, you know, make the case that money, you know, does make the economic world go around. Now, there is a claim in your book, what I call a surprising claim, and we have some of our colleagues from S&P Global and former colleagues here that could be surprised by uh, one of the discussions you have in your book that governments never really ever need to repay their debt. And that we shouldn't think of debt as the stock which is for our children or our grandchildren that's mm. going to build up and be a burden on our grandchildren. But why don't you explain to the audience what you mean by that? And there might be a few skeptics in the audience that will find them here, but uh, <laughs> just explain a little bit more about that. Right, right. So 
in, in having this discussion, um, you know, it's, it's really important to make a, a sort of a distinction, which is between uh, anal explaining and analyzing how things around money and government debt work at a sort of fundamental or underlying level um, and versus how they actually work in practice, given the different institutional arrangements that have evolved. So when I say that government debt, what we call government debt, is not really debt in the sense in which we normally think of it, which is debt is money that we borrow and we have to repay, but rather government debt is better thought of as one of the, is, is money. And so, okay, go back a, a step to your previous question. Um, one of the things I try to do in the book is explain how money gets into the system, into circulation. Uh, so GDP in the US is about $26.5 trillion now. And M2 money, that's one of the conventional definitions of money, is about $21 trillion. But if you went back 10 years, that was more like $11 trillion. So as the economy is growing, sort of money is coming into the system. And one analogy, I don't actually use this in the book, but it, it, it's probably useful, is think of the, the, sort of the economy being this bathtub. And the money is the water in the bathtub. But the bathtub keeps expanding because the economy keeps growing. So you keep needing to get more and more money into that bathtub. Not too much, not too little, the right amount. So how does money get in? How does that water get into the bathtub? Basically two ways. Uh, one is banks create money when they lend. So anyone who's gone to a bank and said, could I have a housing loan? Could I have a consumer credit? When the, when the, the bank gives you that loan, they're actually creating money. That's what you get and you start spending it. So that's one way. But the other way is through governments running budget deficits. Running a budget deficit effectively means that the government is injecting more money into the economy than it's taking out. Now, usually that deficit is turned into a government bond. But what I argue in the book is that um, that's, that is not a, a debt that needs to be repaid per se. However, that doesn't mean, just let me explain that. And I'll, at this point, I, my convention is to reach for a $20 bill. In other words, <laughs> government debt, and, and you know, there's a reason for the $20 bill. Andrew Jackson is, is it's a little bit of an inside joke, but anyway. Um, this is fiat money. And this is a liability of the Federal Reserve. It's signed by the Secretary of the Treasury and the US Treasurer, two different people. So you could start by saying, Okay, now if we have too much of this, we're going to get inflation. If we have too little, uh, we run into problems as well. We need the right amount. But one thing you can say about this fiat money is, even though it is a debt of the federal government, because the Federal Reserve is part of the federal government, this is not a debt that in any sense ever has to be repaid. So in other words, if you took this to the Federal Reserve and they let you in, and you said, I want my money back, they would take it and just give it back to you. Or they might give you $21, $21 bills. Well, what's that got to do with government debt? This is on the central bank's balance sheet as a liability. If I took this $20 note and put it in the bank, now it would be, I'd have a bank deposit, but that would also increase reserves, that is the deposits that the banks have at the Fed, by $20. In other words, this would change into a what's called a, a reserve, which is part of what economists call base money. Now, again, that reserve, you might end up with too many of them or, or whatever, but that's not something that has to be repaid. Mm -hmm. Now, what about government bonds? It looks like they have to be repaid, but essentially the federal government could, and this working with the central bank, could turn the government bonds into reserves. And that would, I think, convince you they don't have to be repaid. This is not an argument to say we don't have to worry about government debt. There are various reasons to worry about it, most importantly, because it could lead to inflation. But, but I think we should disabuse ourselves of the notion that the government debt that's building up in the economy is a burden on our grandchildren. No, it's actually purchasing power that we're leaving to our grandchildren. Now, it might end up that there's too much of it, in which case the government would have to withdraw some of that money. You might say, well, isn't that repaying the debt? I mean, we could, it becomes a little bit semantic at that point. But um, that's probably, when you get into the weeds of it, the one of the most important points that I would want 
people to take away from the book. It's not my original thought. There are a lot of other economists out there that have made that point, um, but uh, it's still quite controversial. Next time I hear people talking about market liquidity, I'm gonna think about a bathtub. <laughs> You just opened up the discussion about central banks. And, and I know when, when you and I were working together, one of the things I, I liked was to track you down to get the latest news about what's happening with central banking, the interest rates. Paul actually reads the Fed minutes for fun. Um, and, and so to get uh, insights from you, and one of the things that you were, you were a witness to the first QE that took place in Japan in the early 2000s, and then over the last... 10, 15, 20 years, we've seen a whole explosion of QE and then QT that went the other way. Mm -hmm. Just talk a little bit about quantitative easing, the tool. You talked a little bit about the central banks and uh, reserves, et cetera, but let's talk about QE and mm -hmm. what role that's played in the role of central banking. Right. And stop me if I go on too long because <laughs> it, it can get complicated. But I say quantitative easing is the policy that we've seen the Fed and other central banks use on a big scale since the global financial crisis. So if you went back to 2008, before uh, the financial crisis, uh, nobody really paid much attention to the Fed's balance sheet. It was about $900 billion at the time, but it wasn't a particularly interesting variable. People were focused on what was the interest rate going to be, the federal funds rate. Uh, the financial crisis changed all that because the Fed took up a policy that the Bank of Japan had pioneered back in March 2001, so-called quantitative easing. So what is that? Um, central bank, when it needs to ease monetary policy and stimulate the economy, cuts the interest rate. Uh, well, it can really only cut it to about zero. We've actually discovered that you can have a slightly negative interest rate, but let's park that one for you know, another discussion, too complicated. So let's say that zero is the lowest level that the central bank can cut the interest rate. But what happens if it does that? And then it says, I haven't finished with my monetary easing. I still want to ease further. Well, one policy it can do is this so-called so quantitative easing. What is that? Basically, the central bank then goes out into the market and buys a bucket load of government bonds. It could buy other assets, but typically government bonds, treasuries, also MBS, mortgage-backed securities, which are government, government guaranteed, but basically government bonds. And it pays for those government bonds by creating reserves, essentially crediting the accounts that banks have with the Federal Reserve. So it's sort of printing money in that sense. And what's the purpose of doing this? Well, well normally the central bank tries to push the overnight or the, the, the one day ahead interest rate down or up, depending on what it's trying to do. But if it hits zero, it can't go any further. But what it can start to do is say, well, let's try and push the interest rate, the, the two-year interest rate, the five-year interest rate, the 10-year interest rate, push those longer term rates down. So that's what quantitative easing is sort of aiming to do. Um, what I point out uh, and have pointed out for many years is a, a, a more conceptual way to think about it is that it is essentially a debt refinancing operation of the consolidated government. That means the government, including the central bank, debt refinancing in the sense that what the what the the government itself is doing via the central bank is retiring government bonds and refinancing them into central bank reserves. Uh, and you say, what's the point of doing that? Well, a government bond and a central bank reserve are two different forms of government liability, if you like, government money, but they're slightly different. And being slightly different, that triggers various effects in the financial markets, which essentially add up to monetary easing. But this sort of comes back to what I was just talking about before with the $20 bill. The reason that I kind of came to the understanding I did, which started in Japan in March 2001, was that even though central bank reserves and government bonds are two sort of different forms of the same thing, one of them has this repay by date attached to it. The other one doesn't. So again, the reserves sitting on the central on the Fed's balance sheet today, about $3.3 trillion, they never have to be repaid. And but you say, hold on a minute, if the Fed is creating that much money in a sense, isn't that going to be inflationary? Well, no, because now the Fed is paying interest on those reserves. Interest rate is now about 
between five and five and a quarter percent. So actually, the the Federal Reserve has sort of turned itself into a version of the Treasury. It's the one that has got well a big chunk of it's sort of call it debt uh, money in in the hands of the public, and it's paying interest rate to the banks on that money. But the one thing it doesn't have to worry about is ever having to repay that money. Mm -hmm. When a lot of times when we hear the word money, people think about wealth. And one of the chapters in your book is about inequality and about gaps of wealth and people that have money that people that don't. Why did you write that chapter? What are, what are the, some of the things you've observed about inequality and why did you think it was important enough to include mm. it in your book? Well, inequality is you know, income inequality and wealth inequality. So both, you know, one is, a, if you like, a flow of money. The other is a stock of money. Um, so I thought, well, I need, you know, somewhere in this book, I'm talking about different facets of money to sort of explain how inequality of money fits into the system. And again, you know, I'm perhaps a little bit of a contrarian. I've got this contrarian gene uh, in me, I guess, or DNA. And, you know, I sort of stuck my neck out a little bit and, and sort of said, look, inequality gets a very bad name. And it's very easy to rail against inequality. And, you know, I'm sort of as compassionate, I think, as the next person. But I think a lot of that discussion, um, which was really triggered, importantly, by Thomas Piketty's book in 2014, I think it was, Capitalism in the 21st Century, where inequality really came back on the radar screen. Um, I think to a large extent, this inequality is a sort of necessary evil, or it's a byproduct of the way in which the monetary system and the economic system works. And so I think if you're worried about inequality, there are ways of dealing with it, but you don't really, you always have to consider what is the alternative to the kind of inequality we have. And you know, one of the points I make, I talk about you know, people like Jeff Bezos, for example, I was just checking today, I think his net worth is, you know, $150 billion or something. So it's like an obscene amount of money, obscene inequality. But when you think about where that comes from, I think there's a kind of a version of Adam Smith's invisible hand at work in the sense that it's sort of, it, it's hard on average in general to make a lot of money in this world without satisfying a lot of consumer wants. And you know, you'll hear these arguments, we should tax the rich. Um, and maybe, you know, why don't we end homelessness by taxing Jeff Bezos, take 100 billions off, off his 150 billion of net, of, uh, of net uh, worth. The problem is when you think about that $150 billion, most of it, a good chunk of it, is essentially paper wealth. It's essentially the stock market capitalization of Amazon in this case. And it's essentially capitalizing a future flow of profits from a whole lot of satisfied customers who are going to be using, or at least investors today, think that uh, in the future, Amazon will be doing a good enough job that the stock price will be high, capitalizing all of those, uh, those profits from the consumers. So in other words, the other side of the inequality coin is actually a lot of prosperity that is generated. Um, also in that chapter, there's quite a bit in there, but one other point I, I make is that, again, linking back to some of the earlier arguments about government debt and, and where money comes from, the government doesn't, if the government wants to end homelessness, for example, complicated issue, it doesn't need money. It has the money. It creates money by its own spending. What it's going to need is the resources. It's going to need the, the purpose of the money is to command the resources, and those resources have to come from somewhere. And unfortunately, the idea of taxing the rich doesn't necessarily work that well for two reasons. I'm not talking about the super rich. The super rich are so rich, the uber rich, that even if you took away half of their wealth, they wouldn't consume that much less. In other words, the purpose of taxing the rich is not to get their money, it's to free up the necessary resources that you can then allocate to other social uh, social projects, such as ending homelessness. Um, so that's a, that's a sort of a, 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 a problem there. And at the end of the day, unfortunately, politically, 
um, you're probably going to have to tax the middle class. You don't want to tax the very poor because they're the people you're trying to help. Um, you're not going to get that much by taxing the uber rich. Um, but the resources are going to have to come from the middle of the population. Um, somebody has to give this bad news. So here I am. <laughs> in, you have a chapter on, <clears throat> on financial crisis, and maybe it was a little bit timely. Uh, one of the points in your chapter is that we will continue to see banking crisis. And a couple months ago, we had SVB. We had a couple of other banks that were teetering. There was some discussions, especially in the popular media, that we might see some more bank runs, that the where the middle market, mid-cap banks in the United States going to see some sort of a serious problem. Seems to have backed off from that. Uh, but one of the key points in that chapter is that we will continue to see problems with banks. It's not going away. It's inherent in the banking system. How do you see that? Uh, you've worked in banks. How, how do you see that? What are the risks we're looking at? And do you have, if you have any comments as well on the recent uh, problems with the middle mid cap banks? Right, right. So the, the sort of overarching sort of analytical point you've just touched on, Doug, is that again, given the system that we have that generates a lot of prosperity and makes you know create helps us create 26, 20, 27 trillion dollars of GDP and counting in the U.S. So a lot of a lot of a lot of good stuff here. It's um, intrinsically there is a kind of an inherent uh, risk in the system, which is the following: if you think of the, the banking system or the financial system more generally, think of it as a balance sheet. So what are the assets of the banking system or the financial system? Well, they're effectively ultimately the productive assets: the, you know, infrastructure, factories, offices. Um, human capital, intellectual property. These are inherently sort of illiquid things that, that create goods and services. But what the financial system does, and the banking system in particular, is on the other side of the balance sheet, create money, bank deposits, and various other kind of financial uh, claims, which ultimately are claims on those illiquid assets. But to the people who hold them, they might be stocks, they might be bonds, they might be bank deposits, um, that's sort of liquid money. The problem is that there's a kind of fallacy of composition in that system. What that means is that what is true at the individual level or what feels to be true, that is, oh, I can go to the bank and get my money out at any point, um, is not true at the aggregate level. In other words, if everybody tries to get their money out at once, if every, everyone tries to tap into the liquidity that they think they have, guess what? It's not there. Banks don't keep money in the bank. They have claims on illiquid uh, resources. Um, and that's not a criticism of the so-called fractional reserve banking system. Um, it's just, it's more of a design feature rather than a bug. Now, there's one entity in the, and that's a financial crisis. If everybody loses confidence, so you mentioned Silicon Valley Bank, uh, they lost 40 something billion dollars of their deposits in one day, which was about 25%. They were looking apparently at losing 100 billion the next day. Um, and of course, now those deposits can flee electronically, but um, they can't if the bank doesn't have the, the liquidity to, to supply. And there's one entity in the economy that can supply that liquidity at will, and that's the central bank, and that's the lender of last resort. Uh, again, if you think of what's going on here, people try to pull their money out of the bank. Let's say they put it all into banknotes. What that is going to do is quickly drain the deposits that the banks have with the Federal Reserve. However, the Federal Reserve can just point a hose at those deposits and fill them up with just by tapping keystrokes. They can create money at will. Um, but of course, that's also rather unpopular in many, it sounds like a bailout and, and, and everything else. So the lender of last resort facility or function of the central bank, it's really a very important social tool to make sure that uh, financial crises don't pull the whole house of cards down. But again, it's a it's an exorbitant privilege almost that the central banks have, and they're very cautious the way they use it. So speaking of financial crisis, in that chapter in your book, you also talk about Lehman. And at the time when Lehman went into bankruptcy, you were the global chief economist. 
you have a view that's maybe contrarian to others. And there's a lot of people who have views, they should have let it go, they shouldn't have let it go, moral hazard, no moral hazard, et cetera. Why don't you share with us your view about Lehman as well as the actions that were taken at the time mm. to basically let it go? Right. Um, it, again, I stuck my neck out in the book because, you know, who is going to listen to the chief economist of Lehman Brothers say that the Fed and the Treasury should have bailed the bank out? <laughs> um, you know, it's like I have a credibility de deficit here when I have this conversation. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I do like to look at these things sort of you know, clinically and, and analytically. So the issue was that there's a section of the Federal Reserve Act, Section 13.3 which is called unusual and exigent circumstances. And that is essentially the lender of last resort article in the central bank. The Federal Reserve Act is written in very arcane language. And this has rarely been used, but it was used a lot in 2008. And the Fed, so what does this say? It has three elements in it. It says, first of all, it's unusual and exigent. So it's something that is normally never used. But it says that the Fed and by the way, it has been revised since 2008, some wrinkles put on it. But as it was existing in 2008, it says that the Fed can lend to any individual, uh, corporation, partnership, anybody. That's important because usually it only lends to banks. Right. It doesn't lend to, say, you know, the likes of Lehman Brothers, for example, an investment bank would not have been eligible. But under Section 13.3, lend to anybody, you or I, in theory. Second condition is, but only when that entity cannot obtain finance from anybody else. So that's the unusual circumstance here. The only entity in the economy that is prepared to lend is going to be the central bank. It's pretty unusual circumstances. And the third uh, proviso is that uh, that lending has to be secured to the satisfaction of the board of governors of the Federal Reserve. So everything hangs on the interpretation of satisfaction. And what the Fed after, so Bear Stearns was kind of, I don't like the word bailed out, but there was a, a, a sort of a shotgun marriage done with JP Morgan. It didn't go into bankruptcy, it was managed smoothly. Shareholders took a hit. They got a little bit of money back, but they took a big hit. When it came to Lehman Brothers, it went into chapter 11 bankruptcy. The Fed did not give it a lifeline uh, in the way that it did with Bear Stearns. And the reason they gave was they said, well, we could not fully secure our collateral, our, our lending to Lehman Brothers. And I've always sort of taken the view that um, the, the, uh, Section 13.3, I'm not a lawyer, but you know, maybe the lawyer in the audience will challenge this, is not saying that the lending has to be 100% guaranteed in the sense that the Fed is 100% sure that it's going to get its money back. Rather, it has to be satisfied that um, the circumstances in their totality are such that it can actually do this. And, and so I think that really uh, there is an argument that says the Fed probably could have and should have from the viewpoint of saving the world from the very deep recession and financial crisis that ensued. And if you look at the memoirs, and I quote some of the memoirs of Hank Paulson and Bernanke and others, there was a kind of a catch-22, because on that fateful weekend, there were a lot of bankers, I guess, in the, the around the, the, the table at the Federal Reserve, downtown at New York Fed, um, trying to cut a deal. But there was nobody willing to step in like JP Morgan did. And the bankers were sort of saying, well, unless the Fed is going to throw a bit of a lifeline, we're not going to come in. And then, of course, the Fed and the Treasury were able to say, well, no banker is willing to step up here and take on that role, so we're not going to provide uh, the financing either. So I think it was a little bit of a, a, a sort of a governmental failure that really exacerbated the, the financial crisis. But other people would say that was the only way you were going to get the TARP, that is the Troubled mm -hmm. Asset Relief Program, that is that $700 billion dollars of money that the Congress uh, approved to recapitalize the banking system. So it's kind of a bit of a chicken and egg thing going on here. Like we need to have a financial crisis, essentially almost bankrupt the whole of Wall Street. Then Congress will fess up the money. Well, I would have said, look, probably would have been better to have done something a little bit more tactical and smarter using 13.3, take the heat, but at least we would have been saved a lot of yeah. pain. The first question I asked you is about pennies and discs, and you have a $20 bill in your pocket. 
Um, so I want to ask you now about something that has nothing to do with physical money, but mm -hmm. but crypto and Bitcoin. And what's the future of money in a, in a world where with blockchain technology, we see all types of new digital currency. We see central bank, digital currency, et cetera. What, what do you think about digital currency? Uh, that, that's again, that's a fascinating uh, topic. So that's the last or essentially the last chapter of the book. Again, you can't write a book about money and not talk about cryptocurrencies. And it sort of fits in nicely to our, your previous question, Doug, about the financial crisis, because Bitcoin, which was the original cryptocurrency based on this new, exciting technology of blockchain, and we've all come to realize that blockchain, the distributed ledger technology is different from the currencies, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and 20,000 others that kind of live on this blockchain. But Bitcoin was the first one, and uh, its birth was uh, October 2008. That's when the financial crisis was, was happening. And the first issuance, I think, was January 2009, when the economy was in deep recession. And, and so these cryptocurrencies started from sort of this crypto anarchism. That is, um, people. You know, if you go back and look at the, the the rhetoric around this, was we can't trust central banks, we can't trust banks, we can't trust governments. We need this sort of people's finance, this cryptocurrency, and Bitcoin and blockchain are really ingenious things. Um, uh, but the question is, okay, is that the future of money? And and I I don't think so. The bottom line is that I I see cryptocurrencies as being uh, really disruptors, and maybe in a sort of Schumpeterian, um, famous economist, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, where he talked about creative destruction. You get these new technologies that come along and destroy things, but they innovate as well. But what is happening, I think cryptocurrencies in terms of are they going to displace this sovereign money system that we have, very, very unlikely. One reason is I don't think governments will let them. That's an easy one. But what's happened, um, as you know, is that we now have all this talk about central bank digital currencies. Um, so just about every central bank in the world now, certainly every major one and many like smaller ones that may be less prominent, have got either prototypes or research groups working on central bank digital currency, which is essentially the idea of using blockchain or sort of cryptographic tokens, various these new technologies to issue their own currency. So in other words, um, a digital version of this. Now, there is a digital version of this, which is those reserves I've been talking about. So Citibank, JP Morgan, et cetera, has uh, deposits at the central bank. They're not really deposits, but money at the central bank. That's digital money. That's all digital. And all of the transactions in the economy ultimately are, sen uh, are settled at the central bank through those digital currencies. There's another digital currency sort of like this, which is if I put this in the bank, I now have an entry in a bank ledger. It's essentially a digital dollar. But that is now a liability of a commercial bank, not of the Federal Reserve or the government. So when you really think about this, and by the way, just by taking this money out of the bank, I, I turn a commercial bank liability into a federal government liability. And if I put this money back in the bank, the government does nothing, the bank does nothing except take the money, but I've now changed a federal reserve liability into a commercial bank liability. So when you think about the way that this system works at the moment, it's actually a very odd system. It has many strange features, but we're so used to it. We're like fish swimming in water. We don't notice the water. So the big discussion now in central banking is, well, the technology now exists for, and, and, and the central banks better start doing this, otherwise somebody else might do it for them, the cryptocurrency people and maybe Lib, you know, Facebook or somebody's going to come along and do this stuff. So there's a serious discussion about should the Federal Reserve and all these central banks start issuing sort of digital currency to you and I? Uh, to the general public. And then you maybe you just have your phone and you have your wallet and what you're doing when you're doing buying things and whatever, you're just sort of 
uh, moving digital versions of those banknotes around in the system. Now, that then starts to raise all sorts of questions. Well, what do banks do? Um, will you get a flight of safety uh, from the banking system into the Fed's balance sheet? Um, what about you know privacy issues? And you know, maybe one thing to have Citibank uh, watching your money, but you know, what if it's the Treasury and the IRS and, and, and whatnot? So it, all sorts of questions are being begged here. But I think the future is cryptocurrencies will not displace the sovereign monetary system. But I don't think once you, you, the genie gets out of the bottle, it's very difficult to put it back in. And I would not be surprised if over the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, a lot changes in the way in which governments are sort of issuing money. So in other words, if you had a digital dollar uh, that was on some kind of Fed blockchain, for example. Um, you also have new kind of possibilities, which is um, they, the, the Fed could start to pay interest on those digital dollars in a way that they can't do with, with currency. Uh, you could have potentially, if you got rid of the banknotes, there were no banknotes anymore. It's about 9% of, of mm -hmm. money at the moment is banknotes, but some countries it's down to four or five. There are some economists that would like to see that go to zero. Then you could start to implement negative interest rates, which would be, again, a very strong stimulus to people to spend the money that they have. And you could also use it in the other direction, that you could have kind of you know, digital fiscal transfers would be much easier. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're probably moving into, again, 10, 20, 30 year time frame is a kind of fusion of monetary and fiscal policy as we know them today. And I think we're gonna to have to think about developing some new institutions to govern that role of the government in producing money. Because the reason we made the central banks independent in the first place was to essentially put the shackles on the government of its ability to create too much money. Um, I think these new technologies are gonna open the, the Pandora's box again. And I think we'll be able to tap into some new interesting innovations, but we're going to have to guard against that age old problem of governments running the printing press too much because um, obviously when it comes to election time, there are some benefits from doing that. We have time for some questions from the standing room only audience. Um, let's start back here, Christian. Mm. Thank you, Paul, and uh, for an excellent interview. Uh, I want to go back to your original opening comment where you mentioned that money is purchasing power transferred over time. Now, if you look at our national budget, the two biggest components are defense and debt service. So could one also argue that this is lost purchasing power transferred over time because with that large allocation, we are transferring to future generations the expense of our excessive spending on, on defense and as a result of the deficit on, on the interest that has accumulated. As an example, I would, I would argue, I, I would look at the recent um, uh, agreement that was made on the lending where to reach the debt ceiling agreement, Medicare was cut, food stamps were cut and so forth. But if the debt ceiling was not an issue, why could none of those things have been cut? And we could still have gotten the debt ceiling extension. In other words, we are losing purchasing power as a result of which we have to cut spending that affects certain stratas of society that are ending up hurting more than others. Right. So thanks, Christian, for your question. There's a, a, a lot in there. But just to pick up on the, the sort of the grandchildren point, again, we, we hear all the time that the problem with the debt. So what are the debt numbers, by the way? It's about uh, federal debt at the moment is about thirty one trillion dollars. And that sounds like a lot of money. It's a lot of money. But uh, nominal GDP in the US is about twenty seven trillion. So it's sort of you know in that ballpark. But um, that number is a little bit inflated as well, because that includes debt that is held within the government. So if you net that out, you get down to about 24 trillion. But um, that 
So if you look at uh, the data that the government published, the debt held by the public, about 24 trillion, that includes debt, uh, the treasuries that are held by the Federal Reserve, which is part of the, the government. So if you take that out, you're down to about 19 trillion. Okay, so it's not as bad as it sounds. Um, what I'm sort of arguing against in the book, and again, there are other economists, Stephanie Kelton and some other, Randy Ray and, and people like that who've made these similar points, um, that it's not that the burden, what we leave to our grandchildren um, is not the debt itself, at least as something to worry about, because actually that debt is going to be an asset for some grandchildren and it's going to be a liability for everybody else, the general taxpayer. So there are intra-generational issues here within generations you know, who has the money and who owes the money is an issue. But it's not really an intergenerational problem that we have to worry about per se. That's not to say that we don't have to worry about our grandchildren. Um, what the grandchildren are going to, uh, or the grandchildren's grandchildren, are going to inherit, you know, is this earth and the capital stock. Um, and, you know, hopefully we won't have destroyed the environment too much. But typically... What's happened for most of human civilization is we've had technological innovation and we've had accumulation of capital. So people are born into a world in which they're actually net beneficiaries of a, a lot of prior generations, blood, sweat and tears and investments. So I have a hard time staying ahead at, at, awake at night worrying about, oh, the $19 trillion or whatever it is, depending on how you calculate that is being transferred forward. But you also touched on, Christian, issues within uh, you know, society. Um, and ultimately, you know, governments and societies have to choose how they are going to you know, allocate resources and who's going to get what. So nothing I've said tonight should be interpreted as, think, as saying, oh, that's nothing to worry about, or that's easy. No, uh, governments can print money and they will find that they run up against a resource constraint. And that's what happened coming out of COVID. Why did we get 8% uh, inflation? We suddenly had uh, a lot of money sloshing in the economy and we had an economy that had been impaired by COVID and wasn't able to produce as much it was, as it was producing before. So, you know, the polity and the political process still has a lot of work to do to figure out, you know, how do we do this thing? How do we distribute wealth? How do we allocate resources? But the debt issue for me, and you, you mentioned the debt limit, Christian, is really a, a lot of it is about how, what do you think the role of the government should be in society? Do you think it should be big? Should it have a big role in sort of you know, doing stuff? and redistributing wealth, or do you think it should have a smaller role and it should be left much more to the market to generate these outcomes? Um, in both circumstances, if the Fed is doing its job, uh, the economy will be at full employment and there'll be just the right amount of inflation, but you'll have a very different distribution of resources. Let's go to Jean-Claude. Yeah, the microphone's coming. Thank you very much for a fascinating conversation. Uh, very briefly, I'd like, uh, you mentioned Lehman, and I live through Lehman. Uh, I also live through Drexel. And to come back to your analogy about bust-up, liquidity. If, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, the case of Drexel, which was 1992, I was in the US working for a financial institution. All of a sudden, the junk bond portfolio of Drexel, which was refinanced on a 24-hour basis through commercial paper, could not be rolled over. There was no backup facility, and there was no access to the discount window. So all of a sudden, in 24 hours, Drexel went bust because of liquidity. If Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. After settlement of the liquidation of Drexel, a few years later, there was a surplus. In the case of Lehman, I don't think there was a surplus. So my point is, back to liquidity, what matters at the end of the day is to be able to find the lender of last resort. If there's no lender of last resort, the whole thing collapses. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jean-Claude, I'm not that familiar with the Drexel case. Doug might be more familiar with that than, than I am. Um, but again, you know, I'm not gonna you know, die on a hill with, for Lehman. It's all water <laughs> under the bridge. <laughs> 
But it did strike me at the time, and again, as an economist, I'm writing my weekly report. And if you look at sort of what happened was, we, you know, again, the way in which the Lehman bankruptcy was was handled, it caused, you know, a lot of, you know, very bad fallout in the in the economy. And then at the same time, we're having this dramatic monetary and fiscal policy easing. And I think there's a just from a kind of a policy coherence viewpoint, a good argument to make that when we get into those kind of circumstances, you probably want all your policy tools acting in you know in unison in a way. So I would again, I'm, I, I, I veer a little bit more on the side of sort of hold your nose, take the political heat and step in as lender of last resort. And maybe I'll come back to a Silicon Valley bank. I'm, again, I'm not an expert in this area, but you know, I, I, I spent a, a day or so kind of digging into it and looking at a little bit, trying to figure out what was going on because it was one of the little mini banking crisis episodes. It was kind of a little bit odd, the whole thing, because um, you know, purportedly Silicon Valley Bank went you know, bank, bankrupt because it had this interest rate mismatch mm -hmm. it, you know it had a lot of deposits which would you know basically could flee at a, a, a moment's notice and it had a whole bunch of five-year treasuries and because we had the inflation shock the fed raised interest rates the value of that portfolio dropped and so there's a kind of a a, a, a problem that sort of looks and feels like a classic circumstance where you would want the fed to step in and after all in some sense it caused the problem <laughs> <laughs> um, to sort of you know say, okay, we're going to keep this bank afloat. Now, maybe you change the management. Maybe you step in and you say, I'm sorry, board of directors and top management, you're out, someone else is in, but we're not going to put this bank in, into, into bankruptcy and potentially you know, trigger a whole contagion episode. And then if you look at what the Fed did next, um, both with that bank and Signature Bank, they did something that I was actually very critical of in Japan in the 1990s, which was to guarantee all deposits mm -hmm. of those banks, very Japan-like. And you know, the US used to criticize Japan for doing stuff like that. But And then they put in place a facility very quickly that weekend, which basically said any bank in the country that is feeling this liquidity pinch can bring their treasuries to the Fed window, and we will uh, essentially refinance them at par not at market value. So again, I looked at that week and I thought, well, sort of, you know, you started out being a moral hazard warrior and then you ended up sort of bailing everybody out. So maybe could have been a little bit more consistent and just been had a softer touch through the whole process. Let's take both of these questions, last two questions. Let's take them both and then you can answer both of them. You spoke earlier about the fact that in the end, the middle class often assumes a lot of the burden. I remember in the 1980s, when President Carter was in office, all of a sudden, the interest rates went to 17 and a half percent. And those of us in the middle class didn't know what was happening. And all of a sudden, you thought about the things that perhaps your grandmother said, money is the root of all evil. <laughs> all of a sudden, you didn't have any. And you couldn't buy anything. And if you were looking for a home or an apartment or a condominium, you couldn't afford it. So my question is, if you wanted to address, if you had an audience just of middle class people, what advice would you give them to understand this word money? Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, but better yet, I have to <laughs> announce that the books will be available for free thanks to S and P Global. <laughs> but maybe just to just, sorry, just maybe just to, a little bit beyond that, I won't take much time here. But um, you're talking about, of course, that period of, of 1980s, and my wife is in the audience. We had our first more first mortgage back in those days, and it was like 15, 16 percent, something like that. Later on, we had zero interest rates, and that was but that was a very different world. Um, yeah. Basically, the way that central banking works these days is the Fed is is either jacking up interest rates or cutting them in order to either restrain or stimulate econo economic activity with a view to making sure or hopefully the economy will be at full employment. That means that anybody that wants a job can find a job. 
and we'll have low stable inflation around 2%. The reason you had 17% mortgage rates was because inflation was 10 or 12%. And Mr. Volcker was trying to kill that inflation. And we're in a similar sign of period now. It's not not the same. And one thing I just say for the perhaps people who are a bit more uh, into this stuff, one thing that's kind of surprised me through this whole episode is inflation expectations, measures of inflation expectations uh, have been very well behaved. In other words, inflation expectations essentially measures of what are the markets expecting inflation to be over the next five years, 10 years. You might have expected, given this inflation shock that we had, that they would have ratcheted up. But the theory of monetary policy is if the Fed's doing its job, it has credibility and it's able to control and anchor those inflation expectations. And so although this inflation has been sort of painful, um, it's actually at one level showing the success of the system, although perhaps a little bit too early to com claim complete victory. Let's take the last question. Um, you mentioned um, Silicon Valley Bank. The shareholders lost their equity. So in the sense, there was a price to be paid. And I mentioned that in contrast to Citibank during the financial crisis, where which some people believe was created by the mortgage uh, collateral stuff. And during that period of time, uh, Sheila Bear, the president of the FDIC, said, she could handle the bankruptcy of Citibank. And then the establishment set, stepped in and they kind of poo-pooed her and they froze her out. But uh, if Citibank had gone, if the shareholders of Citibank had gone bankrupt, then you might not have a situation that uh, some people say, including Senator Sanders, and by the way, a lot, majority of those under 30 agree with him that the 1% owns the government as ex evidenced by the bailout of Citibank. And maybe Sheila Bear was right. Yeah, well, I'm, I think I'm on the, I'm, I'm not on the Sheila Bear side of the fence there. Um, the FDIC that you mentioned, the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, of course, is, it, it, it guarantees the deposits up to about what is now 250,000. But again, we've seen examples where they've gone the whole, the whole hog. And, you know, it, it, it is one of its roles is to kind of deal with the smaller banks that, that you know, run into trouble. And typically over a weekend, it will close them down and put them into, uh, a, a, it will basically find a, a, a rescue bank, or maybe it'll take a few weeks to do that, like it did, I guess, with Signature Bank. Um, you know, it's to, to, to ask the FDIC to do that on the scale of a bank like Citibank or Bank of America, I, I don't think they had the capacity to do that, frankly. Now, what happened... Pardon me. She said she could. Have. Yeah, but you know, people say things doesn't mean that that that's going to be the case. <laughs> um, but what happened, just for little fill in a little bit of history, as you probably know, is after the Lehman. So Lehman went into Chapter Eleven bankruptcy, which the idea is basically that it will continue as a going concern, but you know, creditors take a haircut. Well, that's very difficult to do with a big investment bank like Lehman, as we saw, because you just basically get contagion through the system. And, you know, if Citi and, and Bank of America and those banks had been put through that kind of system, and that was kind of the alternative at the time, I mean, it doesn't bear thinking, frankly speaking, the, the financial collapse we would have had. What the lesson that was learned after the financial crisis was to say, we do need some FDIC kind of mechanism to deal with these big systemic uh, banks. And they did a couple of things. One is... The regulators said, okay, you're going to have to hold a lot more capital and you're going to have to hold a lot more liquidity. The problem with that is there's never enough liquidity and there's never enough capital if you, know, if, if you really become uh, the target of a, a sort of a, a flight to quality or a, a crisis. The second thing they did was uh, put in place a thing called orderly liquidation authority, a, a mechanism where they essentially do now uh, give the FDIC the authority to manage a large complex uh, kind of reorganization. But I just, that hasn't been used yet, has it, Doug? No. Nope. And I just think the orderly 
is a little bit of wishful thinking. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that you do need some combination. I guess what I'm saying is you need a combination of, of mechanisms to deal with these financial crises. Um, part of it will involve making sure they don't happen ex ante. Part of it will be firefighting during the crisis. And again, I would err on the, on the side of saying more liberal use of lender of last resort. Uh, again, make sure that there are things attached to that to deal with moral hazard issues, but more liberal use of lender of last authority. And then, you know, if you do have to reorganize, you do need mechanisms like the OLA uh, to deal with it as well. Noel, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Paul, well, thank you for those uh, really exceptional insights. And Doug, thank you for eliciting those insights. And uh, we'll invite everyone now to a reception. And the author has agreed to sign your book.